welcome aboard the Kera Cruise, the first of the cruise debates for AIOC 2023 Kochi. And thank you all for joining us here. As we start the cruise, uh, we will uh, have a series of uh, discussions which are of uh, conflict and also which are of concern uh, in the cornea circles. So uh, with this, I will introduce our uh, panel, uh, Dr. Vanati and Dr. Sujata. And our first uh, discussion for today is what's our first line soldier for fungal keratitis? Uh, the, the first talk will be presented by Dr. Sushank and the rebuttal by Dr. Smriti. So let's, let's give them a big hand. Uh, good morning, everyone. So my talk will be on uh, like my first line soldier for fungal keratitis, whether it is Ozol, Oriconazole or Natamycin. So I'll mostly focus on Oriconazole and Dr. Smruti will speak on Natamycin. So I'll give a brief introduction first and then what uh, about regarding the classification of antifungal agents and then uh, I'll speak on Oriconazole like uh, a review of literature which I did like some in vitro studies then about penetration of the drug uh, followed by uh, Oriconazole as an adjuvant and uh, uh, finally I'll show a few case scenarios uh, where Oriconazole helped in treatment. So, as we all know, fungal keratitis uh, is for leading to 40 to 50 percent of all microbial keratitis cases, uh, mostly caused by Fusarium, Aspergillus, and Candida species. And it leads to cornea destruction and endophthalmitis with severe loss of vision, uh, mostly caused by trauma in an immunocompromised state, ocular surface disease, and uh, due to contact lens wearing. So, these are a few antifungals which we are, which we are using in a for treating the fungal keratitis and I'll be speaking on uh, voriconazole which is a second generation triazole and it acts uh, or it inhibits the 14 uh, alpha sterol demethylase which is an enzyme which will help in uh, uh, making the fungal cell wall or uh, fungal cell membrane. So it is uh, having high intraocular penetration and uh, it is used in recalcitrant cases. So, uh, starting with uh, like in vitro studies of uh, antifungal activities of oriconazole, like oriconazole uh, uh, showed excellent in, in vitro activity against most of the species of uh, Dematiaceous fungi and uh, oriconazole has fungicidal activity against most of the Aspergillus species, uh, B. dermatitis and some Dematiaceous fungi and in vitro and uh, in vivo correlation should be uh, should aid in the interpretation of these uh, results. So now coming to the uh, penetration of oriconazole, uh, one study by Zao et al. Uh, showed a better corneal penetration of oriconazole, uh, suggesting that it is more suitable for uh, deep corneal fungal infections than natamate uh, via uh, topical ocular uh, administration. Then this one study by David et al, which showed oriconazole 1% eye drops are uh, well tolerated and uh, penetrate into human aqueous humor when they are uh, administered at uh, hourly or 6 hourly intervals and they are effective in treating candida aspergillus keratitis and are substantially more affordable than uh, oral therapy and have less potential to cause systemic adverse effects. Then one more on penetration, uh, that is penetration of uh, one more study by Prajna et al. Uh, showed uh, penetration of oriconazole through the intact epithelium is uh, better than uh, natamycin. And uh, now coming to the comparison, one study showed overall there was uh, no significant uh, in uh, 2010, a study by Prajna et al. Uh, showed there was no significant difference in visual acuity, scar size and perforations between oriconazole and natamycin treated patients. So one more study by Ritu Arora et al showed there was no added advantage of 1% uh, oriconazole uh, over topical natamycin in primary treatment of fungal keratitis. And then came uh, our MUT trial or uh, mycotic ulcer treatment trial in 2013 which showed I think Dr. Smruti will focus more on it. That is a uh, topical natamycin is superior to topical oriconazole in filamentous keratitis and uh, monotherapy with topical oriconazole cannot be recommended uh, for filamentous 
uh, fungal keratitis and most of the differences between the two agent was found in fusarium cases and this in vivo result was inconsistent with uh, in vitro susceptibilities uh, uh, reported in earlier studies like ozol was uh, more effective in in vitro so then comes a mud to trial to test the oral voriconazole uh, so no benefit of adding oral voriconazole to topical antifungal eye drops in treatment of uh, severe uh, smear positive fungal uh, ulcers and no decrease in rate of perforation as well as need of therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty among patients uh, receiving the oral voriconazole so there was statistically significant increase in the risk of uh, adverse events of caused by uh, oral voriconazole group so up till now what was shown in vitro voriconazole was better as compared to uh, natamycin and clinical studies are uh, uh, in clinical studies natamycin was better as compared to voriconazole but coming to the adjuvant role of uh, voriconazole so there are uh, studies uh, like uh, the swati shri et al uh, studied the in vitro synergy of natamycin and voriconazole against uh, clinical uh, isolates of fusarium candida aspergillus and carvolaria species and natamycin and voriconazole here they used a combination which demo, which was more effective than single in vivo treatment in all species tested and then dr namrata sharma et al uh, uh, studied comparative evaluation of uh, topical versus intrastomal voriconazole as an adjunct to natamycin in recalcitrant fungal keratitis so they used in uh, ulcer size more than 2 mm uh, depth was more than 2/3 of stroma and no response to natamycin treatment for 2 weeks so they found that bcva was better in topical voriconazole group but uh, intrastomal voriconazole can be tried in recalcitrant cases and now coming to more towards intrastomal injections of voriconazole Uh, as an therapeutic adjunct to management in deep calcitrant fungal keratitis uh, main outcome major is a reduction in size of abscess and uh, resolution of the infection so they gave intrastromal injection in three patients and all showed improvement within 3 uh, weeks of treatment so targeted delivery of voriconazole by intracorneal injection may be a safe and effective way to treat cases in cases of deep seated recalcitrant fungal keratitis uh, responding poorly to conventional treatment modalities so again intrastomal injection was better uh, in additional to the regular antifungal therapy in few studies then some studies done on voriconazole where it was used in treatment of uh, refractory aspergillus fumigatus keratitis also in addition to the corneal transplant it also helped in improvement of the condition and now i'll come to some cases one or two cases i'll show at the end that this is a first case which was referred to our center patient was already on natamycin voriconazole and tablet ketoconazole so what we did we did scraping we found fungal filaments and then we stopped uh, voriconazole then we shifted to only natamate and uh, ketosip along with cycloplegic so we found that uh, it was improving initially but uh, later it was worsened in two days and the visual acuity was reduced to counting finger so in one or two days it was reduced so we restarted uh, voriconazole as it was uh, as patient was taking it and then what we found it was lesion was scarred so here i would like to ask a panelist that uh, when a patient comes to us uh, from referred from elsewhere with uh, all antifungal treatment so is it uh, better to continue the voriconazole or whether to go with our protocol of starting natamycin initially and uh, then add or subtract subtract the voriconazole Uh, thanks uh, sushank uh, can we just have uh, the previous yeah. slide which shows the initial okay M- maybe we can take a few opinion about what they would do here assuming that this was a patient on cocktail therapy looking at the first picture which he is showing it is showing the scarring as well as the density of infiltrate is less so what he is asking about like if the patient was on both drugs 
So in my opinion, I am also cornea. Uh, yes, yes, madam. Yes, so yes. in my opinion, as the patient is responding, should not stop uh, the medicine, should continue the medicine. I, I agree that uh, the caveat is that if something works, let us not disturb that. Any any other opinions about uh, whether we would shift to a different uh, antimycotic or continue? Or is there any show of hands on of use of systemic uh, like oral ketoconazole or oral voriconazole for deep seated mycosis? Do some of uh, our colleagues do that? We do it sometimes, but I just wanted to uh, get inputs. Yeah, we didn't find any advantage. Yes. True. And um, considering a little toxicity of the drug. Yes. Uh, but MUD2 trial showed oral voriconazole in uh, severe fusarium keratitis yeah. also. The instant of uh, going for TPK is less. Yes. Uh, I mean, compar or even comparative. Yeah. So they suggest that oral voriconazole may be in uh, severe cases which is not responding. Even if yes. it is fusarium, you can try. That is the MUD2 yeah. trial. Uh, this one inference. But uh, ketoconazole nowadays I stopped. Once yeah. I used to be a big fan, now I stopped completely. <laughs> if it is deep seated at this stage, I would like to go for uh, intrastromal oriconazole rather than stopping oriconazole. Mm. Uh, sure. I won't change, as he said, I won't change the regime at this stage. Okay. Yes. But you did scraping, then you got fungus? Yeah, we, in scraping, we got fungus. Like our uh, protocol is when patient comes to us and if it is uh, like this, then we do scraping and I got fungus. And then we'll wait for some uh, sensitivity or uh, culture growth later. So, and then we add ozol if it is uh, aspergillus. So if we go by that one, then we'll miss that uh, period of three, four days. So what to do if it worsens in that yeah. four days? Like we stopped oriconazole, then I waited for uh, growth. And if it is aspergillus after three days, suppose report comes, then that uh, three, three days it is worsened like that. And then again, we started ozol. You are lucky so, that you got yeah, fungus, like, but sometimes you yeah, don't, sometimes get also, don't get also. In that yeah. case, what should you do? Yeah. If you follow the yeah, protocol, think, you yeah. follow clinical impression. Yeah. Most of the yeah. time, when you are looking at patients who have been treated elsewhere with multiple antifungal regimens, it decreases the viability of the growth of the fungus it, uh, unless you are able to identify it on a smear. That's when you're able to pick it up. But several times it does not grow on the on your media because the viability for growth is lost by the antifungal agents which have been used for treating here. Again, what we, when we look at antifungal susceptibility to, uh, uh, to a variety of antifungal agents available, it's again variable across various species. It's not as you now definitely say, this is something which we did study and we have just recently published. And what we found is natamycin is still effective against certain species of fusaria. Whereas foriconazole probably has a partial effect against certain species of, of some antifungals which are common corneal pathogenic here. So probably some are responding partially but not totally because the antifungal susceptibility is not total here. But as she rightly pointed out, Dr. Revati, when you find a chronic smoldering infection which has been present for over four to six weeks where parts of the ulcer are healed and parts of the ulcer are deep mycotic here, then you know most of the available antifungals antifungals on an epithelialized service do not penetrate. So when they don't penetrate, then you're not achieving any further therapeutic effect on the medication. So that is when I would probably resort to an intrastromal injection here. So I don't jump to intrastromal on all cases. I only use them on chronic refractory keratitis where the superficial part is healed and you're still having a deeper part of infection. So I resort or use it only in such scenarios here. I don't use it. Otherwise, when your epithelial defect is still persisting, sometimes repeated therapeutic scrapings rather than diagnostic scrapings also help you. So, you know, you are causing a small region of epithelial defect persisting there. That will also help you in penetration here. But then it is also going to increase your stromal haze and stromal scarring if you're going to do repeated therapeutics. So, you will probably wait vis a vis the, you know, the, the place or the area where the, the, uh, the ulcer is present here. And uh, one other which I did find add-on, I'm using 
uh, I, I mean, it was study, it done as a thesis and I used posaconazole in our patients. So posaconazole, one percent. Again, advantage is it, it's something newer. It's not being used in the farming industry. Here. It's not used in agriculture. So most of the agricultural industries are using voriconazole on a higher percentage, which is probably constituting to the increased resistance of the fungi which we are seeing here. I think this was beautifully pointed out in the, the MUT trial, uh, the, the one and two of the Aravind group. And that's something which I really do agree that we are looking at uh, resistance to voriconazole in most of the species which were responding to voriconazole earlier here. But posaconazole is having a wider spectrum of antifungal activity compared to voriconazole here. The only thing is making posaconazole drops is not as easy as making voriconazole. Also yeah. expensive. Yeah. Posaconazole is very expensive. Pos uh, posaconazole, when you're reconstituting from your uh, uh, from your injections, it's a little difficult. Okay, yeah. so again, we have started, uh, we, we did both from reconstituting from injections and reconstituting from the tablets available. And both we had then had to find out a, a way of doing our, uh, our in-house pharmacy did it for us. The tablets is cheaper compared to, but still, yes, it comes with a cost. So good points all, uh, but then we also should have a conclusion that when we are treating yes. fungal ulcers, which constitute close to 40% of all the ulcers that are seen at the community level, should we resort to last line or should we resort to drugs where, uh, you know, like, 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 uh, like the injectable drug? Yeah. So, and then of course, there is something which is also gaining ground is the increasing role of uh, the antifungal uh, resistance meaning that the bugs are also getting resistance. So should we go into that or should we have a more structured approach where we rule out rather than we go in all out and then in the end are really short of options. I think that's that's where uh, the dilemma lies. So this is a last case uh, where a patient came to us, all fungal filaments and then fusarium species. Patient started natamate, atropine and ketosip. But uh, I don't have further photos, but I followed it. The lesion was worsened in three days. Then I added Vozol just uh, before doing any other major and patient improved. So any any take like uh, after three days, if it is worsening with normal treatment, can we add Vozol as a additional major before going ahead for a therapeutic or any other uh, surgical intervention? I think in this type of cases, I do debridement, not in the routine cases. This is like a plaque. Yeah, this is once like you plaque. remove it, comes out. Yeah. So. Uh, the patient also gets better once you remove yeah. the necrotic material. Yeah. Hmm. The necrotic material also adds on to the surface inflammation and the hyperemia. So you would find at least a 10 20% of the surface becomes better once hmm. you start doing uh, removing the necrotic debris as well. Okay. Suppose it worsens after 3 4 days, then will you add ozol or uh, will you just directly go ahead with the therapy? So like the, is, is this there a role of combination? Yeah, role of combination. Let's take, yeah, let's, let's uh, take uh, the people's uh, options about that because now we are dealing with one eye which one may perforate which may worsen yeah it can go anyway so i think the good strategy as, men, as men mentioned is the repeated debridement in such cases and we can wait for topical therapy for few days and if it is not responding then definitely we'll go for the drugs which penetrates more and oriconazole i think it is first line for that okay if we need deeper Penetrate. involvement then yes. we can add a uh, worry one as well. Yeah, yeah, sure, okay. surely. Okay. Uh, why not add, uh, give intrastromal worry instead of topical worry? Natamycin plus intrastromal worry. So there are some very good studies. Again, <laughs> Madam will, uh, you know, like <laughs> justify <laughs> that, that there is no difference. <laughs> that there is no difference. So I for an invasive so modality. Yeah. So I use an invasive yeah. modality of, an in, uh, of, you know, again, we do not know for how long your medication which you put in intrastromal is going to be there. Yeah. So you really don't have no way of really knowing that. You would probably see it clearing here. And uh, I think in practice, taking an ulcer patient back to the OT again and again for repeated is not really going to be, I would probably yeah. give one or two trials of intrastromal on a chronic refractory keratitis and then would probably consider an intracameral wash in these cases. And I do find an intracameral wash works much better here where you're probably able to remove. But that said and done, it's mostly case based. Not every case, you know, behaves the same way. Yeah. Last case, I would have given uh, intrastromal because it is quite deep and surface was healed. Here, it does not look deep, rather it is a plaque. If we remove it, yeah. Yeah. 
most of the time you will find the hypopion improving also. The improvement in the hypopion is an indicator roughly that your anterior chamber inflammation is also responding to your treatment, which means you are probably in the right track. If you find your anterior chamber inflammation is not improving, the hypopion is worsening, these cases also tend to develop a secondary glaucoma in their cases. And when you have those, then I do take them on. Something I think most of us who do, uh, you know, high volume um, keratitis, bad patients, I also now have started correlating it with the VER. If you look at chronic cases, especially if they've stayed on for six to eight weeks, you look at the visually evoked responses, the toxins affecting the optic nerve. If you find that early on, then I pick them up and start doing a therapeutic for them early on. This is something which I have, you know, sort of modified in my practice and that's one way of pre preventing a toxic damage to your posterior segment which even if you heal the ulcer and do a uh, do an optical later on it's probably not going to give a good refractive outcome here thank you so smriti probably you should be ready for uh, two weeks if it is still positive like go for therapeutic earlier than waiting for The, uh, what I would like to say is in for ulcers and everything, you start off with the minimum and then do a step ladder for each case. Yes, I agree and with that, because you have something to resort to at every other step, rather than starting everything in one go, then you do not know what you do after, you know, you find it's, it's not that all ulcers are going to be responding to whatever you're doing. So I think continuing with the discussion, uh, my uh, job today is to again re I mean, everyone that uh, natamycin is still best. Uh, so the limitations of management in fungal keratitis include a delayed presentation. Some of them do not come to us before even 15 days of getting the ulcer. Long waiting time for the culture positivity, as Sushank said, till we are waiting for the positivity, what to do? Limited number of effective antifungal drugs. We, we only have... <coughs> So we have a handful of drugs and then we have to do not have much to do a permutation combination. Uh, prolonged duration of response to therapy, patients get very impatient. Uh, they try to say, I mean, weeks after weeks they come to us and uh, the ulcer doesn't get healed. A highly variable spectrum of antifungal drug sensitivity and uh, high recurrence rate following keratoplasty. So natamycin is a polyene group of antifungals. It is the most commonly used one. It is the only antifungal which is approved by USFDA, commercially available as 5% suspension. So we have to shake it well before we put it. And it has a concentration dependent killing fungistatic or fungicidal. On topical administration, sufficient concentration reaches within the stroma but not in the aqueous. This is one of the limitation. And uh, the spectrum of activity, fusarium, I think it is the best, as well as same. And um, other than that, uh, the usual fusarium and aspergillus, it can also work well on alternaria, candida, cephalosporium, carvularia, penicillium, and lacidiprodia. Uh, it also comes with a set of its adverse effect. We have the natamycin deposits on the cornea, furnaces, and lid margins. So many people are like not very happy. They have sometimes a swelling, which they are, and irritation persists, redness, foreign body, and stinging sensation. Uh, so this is, the, I think, a landmark study which was done um, and uh, we have with us even Dr. Revti who can also uh, put some thoughts on this. But this was a kind of a established because it established the role of uh, antifungal, especially natamycin and voriconazole in the treatment of fungal keratitis. So uh, the MUT trial one, it also, it, uh, the about 368 patients were um, uh, randomized to natamycin 5% or voriconazole 1%. And they were, um, and it was seen that natamycin treatment was associated with a better clinical and morphological and microbiological outcome than voriconazole, especially in fusarium species. So uh, we conducted a similar study in our institute, and uh, we, uh, we there also we uh, compared the efficacy of one percent voriconazole versus five percent natamycin, and uh, natamycin was more effective in treatment of fungal, especially in fusarium species. So coming back to the mycotic ulcer treatment trial, uh, so natamycin cases had, uh, there were uh, many um, follow-up studies and the natamycin treatment cases had significantly better three-month best spectacle corrected visual acuity 
than voriconazole cases and natamycin treatment cases were less likely to have perfor uh, perforation and needed less of therapeutic keratoplasty. Uh, fusarium cases fared better with natamycin than with voriconazole and uh, while non-fusarium cases uh, fared similarly. So if you have to think of one drug, if you have a fusarium, then it has to be natamycin. Uh, then uh, this was again another uh, uh, a part of the study where uh, we uh, where they tried to determine whether vision related quality of life outcomes were different between the uh, two groups natamycin and the voriconazole groups and uh, uh, use the indian vision function questionnaire and they found that uh, there was improvement in the vision related quality of life in patients who were assigned to the natamycin group compared to those with the uh, voriconazole this was also especially in the fusarium uh, group. So antifungals, uh, um, madam also said that uh, you know nowadays the uh, azoles they have they are known to have big, uh, have greater predisposition to resistance than the polyenes. Uh, so um, again, when uh, uh, when we uh, looked at the literature on the azole resistance, it was seen that the MIC data which was available for 221 out of the 323 patients, there was a 2.14-fold increase per year in voriconazole MIC after controlling the infectious organism. However, natamycin did not have any such thing. So susceptibility to voriconazole to appear to decrease during the relatively short enrollment period of the clinical trial. Uh, so now that uh, uh, we know that obviously natamycin does work better in uh, many of the uh, in many scenarios then we are worried about the administration that administration only the uh, because we are a little bit hesitant to give it intrastromally we can, we only give the topical drops so this was a study which uh, which in where they had uh, randomized the uh, ulcer patients into three groups uh, apart from the uh, natamycin topical natamycin eye drops they were also subjected to intrastromal voriconazole intrastromal amphobi and intrastromal uh, natamycin so the uh, they compared that intrastromal injections are safe which includes uh, natamycin also they were safe and adjuvant therapy to conventional in the management of recalcitrant fungal carrot you you'd like to say something Discontinue. okay <laughs> okay so uh, then the next is um, suspension we are always worried that suspension does not it has a high molecular weight it does not penetrate so now um, uh, RP Center has a solution for us so it uh, it says that the novel water soluble formulation um, that is a single dose of transcorneal permeation revealed that natasol which is a um, soluble form of natamycin uh, they have attained uh, i mean it attains our uh, uh, cmax at 1 hour and maintains the concentration uh, even 5 and 2.5 times at 4th and 6th hour so it and it did not show any ocular so toxicity so what are we waiting for so uh, the take clinic message is natamycin is better in terms of safety and efficacy it is time tested it has been with us for many times uh, for many years and it is still uh, no, known to uh, give less resistance it is a cheaper option if you compare uh, the natamycin take it any brand it will not cost you more than 100 rupees whereas if you look for voriconazole either a 3 ml or a 5 ml pack per week at least it will cost you some 320 rupees or 350 rupees for 5 ml uh, and also the uh, the issues related to how to make it in a sterile way and uh, under lamina flow that also comes into picture natamycin is readily available there is no storage issues and it has a long shelf life water soluble formulations are much awaited so uh, i think that is going to be the next uh, generation uh, antifungal agents that is going to come and uh, help us with our patients thank you thanks smriti so i think this uh, this brings the other picture the the other side of the coin so here we have a molecule which is effective against fusarium which half of the country does not see and then we have a molecule which is effective but then it is probably the demographics and then what we actually treat on is on the basis of the smear and many a times the culture is negative so with that, I'll just start with uh, Revati ma'am that uh, you know the, your main takeaways from uh, the mud, what would be the message that we should take? Yeah, the, fortunately or unfortunately, again, the reappraisal also coming, it has come from South only, LBP. So again, uh, Fusarium is the major one. So I really don't know because many, I mean, even Dr. Namrata used to tell 
uh, we start um, uh, oriconazole as a first line uh, sometime. Dr. Basak also used to tell that. So we need not right away with the uh, oriconazole. Depends on the uh, type of uh, species what you see in your locality. You can start with uh, even oriconazole and see and then you can decide. Uh, so for us down south of course we have no other question. Natamycin is the first one. Even in non-fusarium, it shows almost equal thing only. So we'll go for it. So, so as a as a community-based ophthalmologist, what what we also face when we are treating patients at at the community level, and sometimes when we are required to guide physicians who are at that level, uh, probably what's only available to them is a KOH slide. Which, which shows us that whether it is hyaline, fungus, or probably it is not. And then that's where it ends. Uh, how, do we, how do we give the message that probably we should stick to one, one drug and then what that drug would be if they have to give one drug? Actually, in a, I mean, a really a, not a full setup uh, area, I mean, practice, uh, managing fungal ulcer for a long time is not advisable. True. So they can start, as I said, according to the locality where they are and the common species they see, they can either start natamycin or oriconazole as the first line and then wait for a week. If it is not showing a response or if it is worsening especially, it's better to refer it to a center where, of course, they are not going to do much uh, by yeah. culture or sensitivity right. pattern. Right. Right. They can start trying other things, okay. uh, intrastromal, all these things they can, like end of thalmitis management only. So okay. I think it's better at that stage to be referred. Okay. But as a first line, they yes. can decide either on natamycin or oriconosol based okay. on the locality. Okay. So so basically that based on the demographics, either drug but one and then not a combination. Sure. Uh, of course, <laughs> I don't go for the combination in the first yeah. drug. Yeah. So so it's also not uncommon in a cornea practice to see patients who are on a cocktail. So so yeah. therefore, uh, I think the, that's a very clear yeah. message. Thank you. That another thing, uh, when we see hypopia on the second case you have so shown, sometimes if you reduce natamycin, this hypopion will clear. Natamycin toxicity also we have to keep in mind. Especially if it is healing, but hypopion persists, you start titrating the natamycin. It will clear off sometime. Uh, then in that case, uh, it's only toxicity. It's not an infective. So, Dr. Samrat, I had a question for you. Now, from the... No, I mean, I mean please also share your comments but from the institute's point of view it's not uncommon to have uh, only a smear that is positive and there's no growth forthcoming and and we have the cornea literally deteriorating right in front of our eyes so the knife is the ultimate decision but but what before that yeah actually you are this thing uh, quite right uh, oftentimes even in the best centers probably the culture positivity is around 50 60 so you really don't get an organism and sometimes you may not get an organism in time to make a therapeutic decision. So you either start with natamycin. If you start with natamycin, something that we forget is epithelial debridement uh, that we just do during the corneal scraping. But we know the suspension penetration is poor. So I think each visit, if we are giving natamycin, then we should debride it. Probably not as extensively, but at least over the ulcer area, the epithelium should not be there to increase the penetration. If it doesn't heal, then the second line is to switch over to uh, either a oral, if you have not started oral, or you start with a uh, voriconazole. If right. it doesn't happen, if it's small and uh, like you, it's not extensive, then you can go for intrastromal. Thirdly, and lastly, if, it, if nothing happens, then it's probably better to do a or, uh, early therapeutic than a late therapeutic. Earlier, the issue was about therapeutics was that tissue availability and all those things. So we waited till the last moment. But in my personal experience, the more we wait, the more uh, the graphs tend to fail. Second, you'll have a lot of post-operative glaucoma. And then you might cure the infection, but you don't cure the eye and the patient is in a cycle. The comment that I wanted to make, and just to keep it brief, is that uh, the, uh, an the antifungal susceptibility is very variable because you need to have the good suspension and that suspension is not quantifiable so unless you have a laboratory your in-house laboratory and they have standardized the uh, suspension of the uh, fungal on which you test the antibiotic then probably it is there so we probably should not you know rely solely on the susceptibility but 
or also on the clinical response for even for bacterial ulcers if we start off with an antibiotic and we see that there's a clinical response but the sensitivity is coming out to be resistant or intermediate how many of us change we don't change we continue yeah, with the yeah. same antibiotic the same thing also applies for the fungus true, thank you true thank you thanks for the good comments uh, i'll prepare my presentation for you audrey you want to take it further any further uh... in antifungal susceptibility how many labs do and it is time consuming the cost is also an issue with that you know it's cost is definitely i think at this point of time natamycin is the first draw still unless it's I very think, deep seated uh, infiltrate you can start borucanazol otherwise natamycin is the yes, unless choice. you're having a very severe ulcer you're looking at a one eyed patient you're having a visual axis involvement uh, i think uh, the dictum is we would still uh, at least i still start with natamycin as a, a first line of drug and most of your superficial keratitis does respond to natamycin several times and if you know you're on the right path you would find healing as early as on your third to fourth day itself and uh, you might not need to but then when it is not responding on early then i do add on a voriconazol for most of my patients and for for us who are in institutional practice we can also reconstitute amphotericin so amphotericin b spectrum is also very good and as as comparison and amphotericin also works well against fusarium here so when you add on nat natamycin still has partial sensitivity to fusarium here compared to your uh, your other medications when you add on amphotericin and i mean that's what we learned when i underwent my fellowship training here and when you add on amphotericin to a natamycin to a severe fungal ulcer which is not responding a singularly to natamycin then i do find a good response. Yeah, but again, we have the facility privilege of an in-house pharmacy, which compounds and for terrace and drops for us. So that's the advantage here. Yeah. Yes, we actually forgot about that. No, but it works wonderfully well. Yeah. Last half an hour of discussion. Yeah. I think it's the first time that we have been mentioned. Uh, yeah. Year 2010, 12, and 14 was the obvious. I still use amphotericin, and I keep my voriconazole for those. Uh, okay. Yeah. healing an ulcer with medical management and making the surface better and then taking on to do uh, you know where your outcomes for your graft are going to be better hmm. rather than jumping on the first phase if that's what initially when it was plus vozol or matlab not only natamycin should you add a drug or as we uh, have a protocol according to mat trial should we go on only with natamycin no in such scenario you can start two drugs no harm in that Uh, because at least they don't uh, contradict each other true natamycin and vosol uh, your paper also pointed out so one night patient already treated with the steroid uh, then i think as a first line uh, once you stop steroid you can use both also no harm in that sure so thank you uh, for a good debate uh, i will be just briefly uh, speaking about the rebuttal on the use of cxl versus pdt so uh, what we do know is that the collagen cross linking has been uh, devised as a novel strategy for preventing or rather arresting the rate of progression of keratoconus uh, but this has also had several alternative uses and one of the most uh, exciting was its probable use in arresting a refractory corneal ulcer while there are many anecdotal reports on the use of collagen cross linking in infectious keratitis uh, these are largely restricted to either smaller case series or perhaps uh, uh, short uh, literature uh, single case reports so while uh, this is important uh, to have it as an adjunct to what we do in our treatment of microbial keratitis uh, probably we should exercise some caution when we take away that okay that we can also use it in our armamentarium meaning that there might be several pitfalls to that and my discussion is on that tipic so we do have a very high load case load of uh, corneal infections uh, in the indian subcontinent and about half of those are fungal and uh, the demographics are also those who are agricultural laborers those who have vegetative trauma and uh, the number of diabetics are also on the rise 
So when we reviewed the literature uh, on the outcomes of collagen crosslinking for microbial keratitis, there were several knowledge gaps that we found. Uh, number one was that there was weak evidence because uh, the uh, the level of evidence was not strong. Uh, there was a variable disease severity. The treatment endpoints were also variable. Study definitions of stromal melt, treatment success and treatment failure was not well defined. Therefore, uh, we are not sure that... Uh, at that point of time, that is up to 2016, whether there was any definitive benefit of adding collagen cross-linking to the treatment. And then came this paper uh, uh, by Dr. Prajna's group, and this was about Claire, which suggested that uh, it probably doesn't work in the setting of a fungal keratitis, probably in refractory bacterial, maybe. And uh, def for acanthamoeba and virus, it was not recommended earlier and going forward, we still are reserved about using this modality in uh, the parasitic uh, infections. Now, if we look at that, that there are several drawbacks to the resident protocol and whatever literature reports are, they are for either peripheral ulcers or very superficial ulcers where uh, probably the penetration might be sufficient. But what the type of ulcers that we see in our practice are much more refractory, much severe, uh, they are almost about to melt. So probably in our setup, we should be very guarded in using the collagen cross-linking. And uh, the other thing that is being studied now is the use of rose bengal. So there are several photochrome pigments and uh, rose bengal, this is one of the most commonly cited study where uh, they studied with 19 eyes and there were 10 eyes of acanthamoeba. But then if we look into the results a little deeply, uh, they also reported that they had continued treatment with the rose bengal PDAT with the continued therapy for the organism as well, meaning that there was the antibiotics and the PDT or rather the antiparasitic agents and PDT were continued and eight eyes needed retreatment and one in five eyes perforated. So all in all, while this is a progress, but this also means that there is still much that we are yet to learn about it. So what we do know is that the drugs penetrate poorly. This is time consuming. There are no standardized protocols. So the verdict is open that should we or should we not use uh, cross-linking as an adjunct. Some comments and uh, queries. This is the rebuttal. Four percent is not on the board. Yeah. See, theoretically, it looks great, right? That we sterilize everything with ultraviolet. Right? All our IOLs are ultraviolet. So why it doesn't work out here? I don't know. But it, theoretically, it should work. But uh, I think uh, probably uh, from India, I think uh, uh, only very few centers have actually propagated it in a big way right from the start. Otherwise, it has really not caught on. And the cost factor is also there. So, And we don't know what happens uh, afterwards, how much will be the apoptosis and everything. No long-term follow-ups. Probably that's why most of us are not very comfortable using it. Whatever literature is for superficial fungal keratitis. So that to any way will respond to medical management. The cost is so, still is not a big uh, thing if it works out. Uh, from the audience, actually, we would like to have a show of hands of how many of uh, them would do a cross-linking. Not, not in infection, but in collagen cross-linking, uh, in, in keratoconus. Okay, so so we have we have a lot of us who who do collagen cross-linking, and and uh, I'm sure uh, you would also be uh, treating the corneal ulcers too, at at some point of time. That may be a variable frequency. So would you would you what do you think? Would you consider using your cross-linker and then cross-link that eye, which is probably going bad? Uh, let's let's have some some inputs from there, uh, sir. Can I can I ask you, sir, your would you, what would be your thoughts? Would you like to use your cross-linker machine and do a cross-linking? Uh, I'm Dr. Yusuf Sheikh. There is a fairly good chance of things getting worse, especially if it is a deeper infection. So, uh, and as someone already said, it will work only in superficial. Uh, and also, we don't know how much UV rays will penetrate if it is a deeper keratitis. So, for superficial infection, Yes, if there are no medical treatment 
option is acceptable to the patient. But for deeper infections, no. Yeah. Superficial uh, one third probably. Okay. So so meaning that you definitely would I like would, to try? Yeah. I mean, okay. it, it won't do harm if the patient is reluctant to accept frequent antibiotic okay. eye drops, for example, or is not accepting the toxicity of the drops. I'm 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 actually playing the devil's advocate here because many a times there are several stringent regulations for performing a PK. Many a times the patients are not willing to go for a PK. And and we have the cross-linking machine which is there in the clinic. So so you know, like sometimes we do know it works. It won't be much harmful if we try, but it yeah. can cause more spread of the infection. That is what I am worried about. Okay. So, uh, I mean, yes, it is known to cause the spread cause of the infection if it is a deeper involvement. Mm -hmm. So, I would be very reluctant to try in that deeper cases. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, sure. sir. Thank you. Sir, any, uh, any updates? Would you, would you like to try the cross-linking? Uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. For your MK patients? Anyhow, if, if we can kill the microbes uh, by any measure, we would like to kill. Means it. Uh, it, if it is working, then we'll definitely try. If, if other measures fail and uh, it is, uh, we know that it is refractory, then uh, why not we should try? Uh, I feel especially the regular CXL uh, is not strong enough to kill microbes. The percentage what we use and all, they try with a higher percentage of uh, uh, fluorescein and they try. But um, that is not what we use in regular CXL is not good enough. But the other uh, action of it is uh, uh, making the collagen fibers resistant to collagenics. So that will reduce the deeper penetration of the infection. So that's why in superficial ulcers it's working. Once you have the deep or full thickness necrotic ulcer, that's hardly anything for the uh, cross-linking to work on. There is no collagen there. It has become necrotic pus. So there it won't work. But PDT, they say even deeper, uh, it has more uh, deeper penetration, but we don't know. Actually, yeah. even Arvind is doing a PDT trial yes. now yeah. in collaboration with Bascom Palmer. True. But we have to wait for the I, I think, yes, yes. Anecdotally, we couldn't say anything. Right. But a regular CXL, I won't go for it. Unless yeah. it's a superficial one, a larger one, as mm -hmm. sir pointed out correctly, the drug toxicity we have to keep in mind. True. So then we can give it a try. One one CXL, uh, uh, this one uh, exposure, yes. and if it reduces at least the need for the medication, that True. helps us. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So shall we go to the next talk then? Okay. Dr. Samrat, I think you, you will have to talk for and also the re a brief rebuttal. Good afternoon. At the outset, I would like to thank the uh, scientific committee for providing us which is such a wonderful venue and Dr. Arvind for organizing this uh, very interesting debate session. So I'll be speaking for uh, the use of corticosteroids in acanthamoeba keratitis and it is an Hamlishian dilemma whether we need to use it or not. So I would like you not to focus on the pictures but on the name, never say never again. And oftentimes for corticosteroids we have used it that we are never going to use corticosteroids. But with growing evidence in literature, we know now that for most of the bacterial keratitis and most of the cases of viral keratitis, we can use corticosteroids safely, but we cannot use it for pythium, uh, fungal, or microsporidial. And for acanthamoeba keratitis, we are going to decide today. So why do we need to use corticosteroids in acanthamoeba keratitis? We know that the cyst of the acanthamoeba, they are antigenic and they can perpetuate you know, a long time inflammation by activating the immune system. The uh, dying trophocytes also uh, activates the um, Im immune system, causes a lot of influx of macrophages, neutrophils, and there is a lot of uh, immune reactions going on and a lot of stromal inflammation. So steroids would lessen that and it would lessen vascularization and it would also lessen the pain. So that's why that's the rationale of using corticosteroids in any microbial keratitis. However, if you look at the clinical data, 
And in this study, which was done way back in early 90s, and I think it's brave because at that time, the use of corticosteroids were much more controversial. They found that if you use corticosteroids, you did not lead to more treatment failures. You did not lead to more perforations. That group treated with corticosteroids did not need more of therapeutic PK. And, but the only thing that it need, needed was it needed a prolonged therapy of anti-amoebic treatment. And uh, very recent results, here they have clearly shown that the risk of a poor outcome increases if you use corticosteroids before anti-amoebic th uh, therapy. And that you sometimes do because you may um, you know, misdiagnose an acanthamoebic keratitis with a viral keratitis. So sometimes there is a tendency to treat with steroids. But this study has not found any increased risk if you use corticosteroids after adequate antimobic therapy or if it is used in certain disease stages. So if it is used in only stromal infiltrate and say epithelial disease, it doesn't increase the risk of a poor outcome, but it increases the risk of a poor outcome if there is an active ring ulcer with hypopion. So the key to success in treating acanthamoeba uh, keratitis with corticosteroids is the indication and the timing. So if you have a very mild disease which is restricted only to the epithelium, you need to only treat with uh, antiamoebic therapy, uh, chlorhexidine or PHMB. You really don't need steroids out here. And if you have something like this where you have already treated the patient with antiamoebic therapy and now you have stromal infiltrate, pain, you can add steroids out here and this would probably not worsen the keratitis. Or if you have dense stromal infiltrates, uh, stromal vascularization like we see in acanthamoeba keratitis, or if there is associated scleritis, then you need to treat these patients with corticosteroids. If there is acanthamoeba scleritis, you probably might need to treat the patient with oral corticosteroids or even sometimes uh, immunomodulators like azathioprine because for scleritis, you need to use immunosuppressives. But if you have a ring ulcer with an active hypopion, this is where you should be cautioned and probably not use it, avoid it, until and unless uh, you see there is a definite clinical improvement. One other indication which doesn't have any literature support is sometimes you can land up with drug toxicity because of uh, PHMB or chlorhexidin. And there it can be either because of in, uh, frequent dosage or sometimes because there may be errors in formulation. They are also stopping the antiamoebic therapy for a period of time and then uh, treating the patient with uh, uh, corticosteroids and restarting the um, antiamoebic therapy is also an indication. But it doesn't have much of literature uh, backup, but it is anecdotal and most of us has probably uh, done it who we have treated patients with um, acanthamoebic keratitis. And if you see that this dilemma is not only with us, whether we need to treat the patient with corticosteroids and acanthamoeba keratitis. This survey done in US found that a significant number of people, uh, cornea specialists, did not use corticosteroids. And while some did, uh, like 9% did it for most of the time, and around 49% did it for some of the time. And the indications were also there when they found that there was persistent inflammation, when they were confident that they had achieved a microbiological cure, and when they had given an adequate period of treatment with antiamoebic therapy. So there are some caveats to the use of corticosteroids. If you need to use corticosteroids, you must never use it before uh, you start antiamoebic therapy. You need to use it only after you have documented a clinical response. Then, uh, and that probably after you give a period of around two to four weeks of uh, intense and adequate antiamoebic therapy. And once you achieve a reduction in the inflammation, and you think that you've achieved your cure, a scarring, then you need to continue the antiamoebic therapy at least for a period of three to four weeks after you discontinue the corticosteroids. So the take home message is, use corticosteroids in acanthamoebic keratitis judiciously on a case to case basis, and that would probably not endanger your treatment. Thank you. So we don't have a rebuttal out here. So uh, how many of us are using corticosteroids uh, for acanthamoeba keratitis and how many of us are not using it at all? Not using it at all. No, it's 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 like there are no definitives yeah, no in, in, uh, in clinical practice because uh, we cannot say 
we never use it never but then there are never say never again never say never so so it's always i would say a fine balance about when i think that's the question that that when it's going to be the most effective and we do agree that the consensus is that we should definitely start it at least 2 weeks after starting the anti amoebic and continue the anti parasitic agent for at least 3 weeks after stopping the steroids so so that is true but then i think uh, sometimes just using a, a corticosteroid as a trial can be can be quite uh, quite i would say disparaging results might come out of that so so should definitely avoid that yeah i think so and uh, probably for scleritis i have lost yeah. a patient for scleritis because yeah. in the very initial stages i was hesitant to use corticosteroid and actually that time period there's a window period when it you can actually salvage the eye True. and if that period goes off or if you have acanthivous scleritis then actually yeah. you cannot do anything about it so that is very important timing True. is very important and uh, to add to that actually we have reported and also we have studied some cases of scleritis which are not really only immune mediated meaning that where we have those pus pointing we have also uh, retrieved both uh, i would say active cysts and and these cysts were were from the scleral nodules meaning that it's not a immune mediated component but rather pro probably a kind of a manifestation of the infectious etiology now in this setting again the steroids should be used in caution because it need not necessarily be the surface inflammation or the inflammatory immune mediated scleritis yeah so uh, there have been reports of uh, you know uh, retrieving the cyst in the sclera but in majority of the cases like in one of our studies we found that there was intense granulomatous inflammation so but there were no cyst in histopath section so in that case the uh, you know the choice becomes much more easier that yeah. you can then start yeah. off with the uh, yeah. steroids earlier true so which is why the message is that even the scleritis could be infectious and therefore uh, again because it is scleritis and therefore we can start steroids might not hold true yeah for all cases no yes. definitely the sclera would not get inflamed because of the corneal component yeah. there has to be some kind of an invasion yes. and probably what happens is that sometimes we kill off the uh, cyst uh, this acanthamoeba in the sclera and then yes. the uh, dying things they lead to the immune that could be a toxic result yeah sure but i think uh, managing acanthamoeba keratitis can be very scary can uh, uh, sort of unnerve us quite badly but i have seen uh, some of those cases where which have healed and uh, um, uh, people have done keratoplasties and then you had an acanthamoeba infection come on you have had cases where the cornea is healed and then after a significant period of time 2 years 4 years later you would find a scleral lesion which is coming up here and uh, this was one case which is a real bad case which i did see when i was doing my fellowship in uh, singapore national eye center uh, a case with uh, with an acanthamoeba keratitis healed a small opacity and then i think dr tan took it up for uh, for an optical triple then so and the patient underwent an uneventful optical triple only to see the patient developed a post operative sclerokeratitis which went into a fulminating stage and could not be salvaged at all so that was a very young girl so i have seen very successful cases of you know you've managed and they've stayed on well for a long period of time now i've also seen cases which were managed and deteriorated with recurrences of you know dormant cysts which were probably lying in the sclera and we never thought that uh, you know it it is there so it's something uh, acanthamoeba is something which always scares me and uh, i think you do get better outcomes when you you identify early and treat them early on yeah so actually this i completely agree this yeah. organism can behave in a very yes. different way and in fact uh, i would request dr sujatha to share her experience yes. of end of thalmitis which she had yes. recently uh, presented in in like one of our grand yeah, rounds yeah two cases uh, actually we did not realize those two cases are from same place because one presented after two two months of surgery another one four months after surgery cataract surgery okay so when the pillow started for presentation we called the patient back and it seems the same hospital same day they were operated acanthamoeba keratitis with end of thalmitis Yeah, I think yeah, yeah, we we saw your publication when Pillow presented, and uh, the take home message was 
वन केस वी कूड हेव पुट इन दि बिट्रियस आस्पिरेट इन एन एन ए बिकॉज वी न्यू वन वॉज फ्रॉम कॉर्नियल स्क्रेपिंग इट वॉज पॉजिटिव द सेकेंड वन बिट्रियस बाय एफ सी वॉज डन फर्स्ट देन कॉर्नियल स्क्रेपिंग और एट द सेम टाइम बट द फर्स्ट वन वी डिड नॉट पुट इन द एन एन ए एंड देन वन थिंग न्यू वी लर्न फ्रॉम युअर पेपर दैट बिट्रियस कैन बी सेंट्रीफ्यूज टू इंक्रीज द ईल्ड ऑफ कल्चर plenty of cells uh, uh, means cis we have seen in these cases regarding the steroid i've not heard or so what was the like uh, how how was the contamination like what would you think would be the contamination at what point of time like the entry of the yeah maybe the water or something or breach in definitely breach because one place breach in sterilization i don't know what water or Could also be, you know, patients' use of water from. Yeah, but patients for both patients same center same day, so okay. something in the okay, first stop. Yeah. Was it same? Yeah, same day they both were operated. So we realized later because one came after two months, one came after four months, but the symptom was there from the beginning of surgery, two days, four days after surgery. One now you went to thysis, another one is still under treatment, but most likely will go to thysis. See the challenge most of us face. is first diagnosing it to be acanthin most of the time sometimes when you send the button for a uh, histopath then the report comes that it is acanthin vipa so for us one is the challenge we don't have culture facilities for acanthin vipa so the it is all smear based so that's a challenge so i think endophthalmitis and all this would be like very very difficult to first suspect diagnose and then you know treat so how do you treat no both the end of thalmite is from vitreous we could not get all these are corneal scraping was positive so you have to think whether post is inflammatory or infectious one i went to thysis another one was intravitreal boriconazole was given but that i also is not doing well could it be so, polymicrobial infection no but we did not get anything from vitreous yeah. uh, yeah. okay so how did you treat that ma'am same like um, uh, we, we, of course like no, or any intravitreals no uh, intravitreal no, no. So nothing only... specific uh, regular endophthal uh, mist management and anti amoebic topically uh, but i think as sujath pointed out all cases uh, they did very bad like none yeah, of them because those anti amoebics would they go up to the vitreous we don't have we any, don't know we don't know oriconazole uh, of... one patient where we knew we gave twice oriconazole okay. the other one we did not know when you did betters by fc mm. we did not know the organism The routine now uh, septicemia and they like yeah. I think they are very very challenging infections. I think Arshun is. I think it's over. Yeah, I think. Uh, <laughs> no, we are almost reaching. So probably that gives us a good time to have a photo shoot for all of us. Or oh, maybe, yeah. maybe yeah. we can drop this and actually see what the tools are. <laughs> 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 maybe attend another session, retina or something. Yeah, and then we can try it. Yeah, yeah. look outside. <laughs> सामने तो टैटेनिक वाले ही है तो टैटेनिक के जोड़े ही इसमें भी एक